I give you a few. Right. The by the way, <laughs> the meeting is is recorded, as you might have seen. Uh, so if you don't want to be recorded, if you don't want your face to be recorded, just turn off your video. Um, we we do suggest the video to stay uh, off for the time of the of the presentation, and unless you need it, you know, to share your question, uh, you can just uh, switch off your video so that this will ease the connection for those who have less uh, data um, available. Okay. <clears throat> so I hope everyone is familiar with the reaction uh, button. I'm leaving you a few minutes to check that out. Thank you, Elsa, for making that clearer than how I pronounce it and the way I <laughs> explained it. Okay, so returning to the program after Ute, we will have the second presentation from uh, Christer Schoenstro, Stockholm University, and uh, with his presentation on development of rating scales for a sentence repetition test for a Swedish sign language. Again, we will have a 20 minute speech and 10 minutes for Q&A. Then we will give ourselves and the interpreters a 10 minutes break. Uh, after which we will come back at 10.20-ish with a third presentation uh, on the development of a fluency rating scale for Swiss-German Sign Language by Katja Tissi, Franz Holz, Holzneck, <laughs> and Tobias Haag of the University of Teacher Education and Special Needs uh, in Zurich. Alessia Battisti from the University of Zurich and Nivia De Jong uh, from Leiden University. Again, I apologize for the bad pronunciation. And after the last speech, we will have a little more time uh, for questions either to the to the authors themselves or to the previous authors. Is our discussion phase. Please remember that at the end of each um, workshop, we uh, share a survey uh, in which we normally ask you if you were interested in the topic, if you like the way we worked today, and if uh, you have suggestions for future webinars. Uh, this survey is important for us because we base our, um, you know, our webinars on this. So if, uh, if you can just stay a few extra minutes after the, the end of the workshop, that would be ideal for us to pick up your feedback. Again, we're very happy today uh, for having this opportunity to host international uh, guests. And um, most of all, we're very thankful to uh, Ialta for funding the interpreting costs, as well as the, um, uh, I'm looking for the name, the University of Teacher Education and Special Needs Institute for Language and Communication, who has also, also contributed this time, which allows us to host a two hours and a half uh, webinar. So we're very thankful for that. No, Tobias, thank you for the link to the survey. Um, I will share it later. Okay. So I guess I have said most of it. So I will uh, leave the, the table to Utekna uh, for her speech on, um, uh, let me find the title again. <laughs> Considerations uh, in writing scale development and validation. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much, Ute. Thank you. And uh, okay, I'll this I'll take myself out of the pin. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Maria. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, you can only see my screen now, not the note pages. Yes, we do it. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the kind invitation and also for being so nice in scheduling 
for a different time so that I don't have to get up in the middle of the night. I really appreciate it. I think my role today is to set the scene a little bit for the talks afterwards, sort of a little bit theoretically. So um, I'll do my best with that. So my paper, as I already said, is um, entitled Considerations in Rating Scale Development and Validation. And a good chunk of what I'm talking about today is actually already published in the journal Language Testing. And I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Bart Dehas and Apishat Kambun-Roang, who've contributed to that paper. So um, as you can see in the images here, rating scales used in language assessment can take a variety of forms. But whatever format they take, they're seen as a really important ingredient in the scoring of productive performances because they represent the test construct to raters. Now, McQueen really helpfully differentiates between two types of test constructs. Those stated in public materials of the test, which she called the stated test construct. And this is usually what you find on test developer websites or in their official documentation about their tests. And on the other hand, those constructs that are actually operationalized and rating scales fall under the operationalized test construct because they represent two raters what they actually should be looking for. However, in my presentation today, I will argue that rating scales are often at odds with the stated test construct. And I think the reason for this is because we just don't give enough consideration um, when we're developing that. So it's not on purpose, but it's just because they're not developed particularly thoughtfully. So in my talk today, I will briefly comment on how rating scale development has been described in the literature many years before the publication of this paper that I'm talking about today. And I will then go on to describe a corpus of studies that we collected and coded to explore how rating scales are actually developed in our field. And based on that study, we developed a model of various sources of scale construct. And then at, later on in the talk at the end, I will show how this model can be used for both rating scale development and validation. So test development is described in many details in our professional standards documents and in all sorts of other publications. But scale development, on the other hand, and how this relates to the larger stated and operationalized test construct is often surprisingly absent from these documents. And also, there's often no information provided about the possible sources that may influence constructs and rating scales. Looking at the literature, um, Fulcher has been very active in writing about this or was very active in writing about this in the early 2000s. And he distinguished between two major approaches to scale development. First of all, there were the intuitive methods where rating scales are designed either drawing on other existing rating scales or on scale developers' own intuitions. On the other hand, he described empirical methods, which involve scale developers carefully examining features of performances collected from test takers to develop the rating scale descriptors. This dichotomous description of scale design was further held up by a 2011 publication that he was also involved in, but unfortunately, it was a little bit different, that um, description, and it confused quite a lot of people. I know quite a few of my PhD students always struggled with this. The, the second bullet point here, performance data driven, is pretty much exactly what he had in the earlier publication, what was called empirical methods. So where um, performances from test takers are used to create the rating scale, but measurement driven was different to the intuitive methods, which he described earlier. And this was, he described this as 
prioritizing the ordering of descriptors on a single scale, that meaning is derived from a scaling methodology, and the agreement of judgment as to the place of the descriptors on the scale. So Fulcher's conceptualizations of rating scale development has profoundly influenced research and language testing. However, others have noted that this dichotomous conceptualization does not always reflect reality and that test developers draw on a range of sources when developing scales. And certainly in my own work, when I was a PhD student, for example, I found this dichotomy really confusing and not very helpful, actually, and not representative of practice. So that was Ute, the impetus. Ute. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. Ute, to interrupt, there was some feedback from deaf participants that when you uh, change a new slide, if you can't leave, people quickly scan, uh, read the text before you start. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks a lot. So this issue of this dichotomous um, conceptualization being problematic was kind of what was the impetus for the study. So the aims of the study was to gain a clearer understanding of what ha actually happens in real world rating scale development. And the research questions we posed was which sources typically impact rating scale design in public research. So we conducted a systematic review of empirical peer-reviewed publications, and we only focused on those that looked at scale development or scale revisions in language assessment and testing. We did a principled search through various databases and also key language testing journals. And we ended up with 36 peer-reviewed journal articles. Now, we actually had a larger corpus of about 50 studies, because we also initially had studies that we had just collected PhD theses, research reports from language testing agencies, or any other kind of scale development studies that we could put our hands on. But when we submitted this for publication with the journal, we were told that we had to exclude all those because they were not peer reviewed. So we excluded quite a lot of studies. And I'm happy to talk about that in question time. Anyway, we had this corpus of 36 peer reviewed studies, and then we developed a coding scheme to kind of extract all the sources of scale construct that were mentioned in these papers. So as a result, we identified 10 different sources of scale construct in the studies, and I'll just go through them. So first of all, there was theory or literature review where the scale de developers drew on a review of the literature or a theory of language proficiency development to inform the scale construct. Examples include models of language development, models of communicative competence, functional adequacy, comprehensibility, and so on. The second one was the target language use domain where the scale developers drew on information about the target language use domain by involving either domain experts, analyzing target language use discourse, reviewing the literature about the target language use domain, and so on. The third source of scale construct were standards framework, for example, such as the Common European Framework of Reference that we're also familiar with. Another source of scale construct were curriculum documents or syllabi. Another one was expert intuition. Existing rating scales. Performance samples from test takers. Another group that we grouped together was all related to raters. So this category grouped together influence on the scale based on either rater feedback, rater think aloud data, um, statistical rater performance data, rater background, for example. Another source of scale construct were tasks. And finally, the score reporting and score use context influenced um, scales as well. 
So CODA agreement was very high, 95.4%. But I do need to mention that we initially also had an 11th source of construct, which we called scale developer intuition. But this resulted in some coding inconsistencies. And we therefore decided to get rid of it because we actually thought every scale has some sort of scale developer intuition in it, and it was difficult to code. We then grouped these sources of scale construct into test external, those that are not related directly to the test in question. Those were test internal, and then a group of others. So let me get onto the results. So this table shows how many, um, which sources of scale construct could be found in how many different studies. So you can see, just a reminder, there were 35 studies in total and performance samples were a source of scale construct in all of them. Rater feedback or something with the raters was also part of pretty much every study except one. When we go to the test external sources, the most common were theory or literature review, existing rating scales, sorry, there's a typo, expert intuition, and so on. We also looked at how many different sources of scale construct were used in the different studies. And you can see here that um, four studies drew on two different sources. 12 studies drew on three different sources. And you can see there were some studies that had as many as six or seven different sources of scale construct. So does the dichotomous categorization hold? Well, purely performance-based was not found at all in our corpus of studies. It was always paired with other sources. And the purely intuitive approach was also not identified at all. And there were also no clear trends in what sources typically appear together. So based on this coding of the data and the different sources that we identified, we created this model of different sources of scale construct. So you can see the, the test external on the left, the test internal, and then the score reporting and score use context, which we called other. And because all testing occurs in a policy space that shapes all sorts of things to do with the um, assessment, we also put the policy context around this model. So the model um, may not be complete. There may be other design choices that may exist that were not represented in our corpus of studies. And it's also possible that our data was skewed by publication bias. But despite this, we feel that this model is actually quite helpful for rating scale developers and testing specialists. Now, in the rest of the paper, I now want to show you how this model can be used. And I want to particularly talk about um, how it can be used for scale development and also for rating scale validation. So starting with scale development, as I already mentioned earlier, um, the guidelines for best practice in testing, such as the standards or the ILTA guidelines for practice, state that test development needs to start by determining the test purpose and the score use. But as I mentioned earlier in my talk, it seems that this test development thinking and the scale development sometimes seem to be at odds with each other. And I will give an example of that a little bit later in my talk. And therefore, I recommend that the model of the sources of scale construct should be integrated into the larger test development process. So this is what I think it could look like. So we should when developing a rating scale, also start by thinking about the test purpose and the score use context. And then um, we should also think about three other aspects, which are at the bottom here in the three black boxes. And this is generalizability or score generalizability, the precision of post-test predictions and score reliability. And only once all these aspects and the five black boxes are considered, should scale development proceed. 
The light gray box here represents the model of scale constructs that I showed on earlier on based on our review. So how do these three considerations relate to the sources of scale construct? Sorry, let me start first by going through these three considerations. So score generalizability relates to the degree to which a score can be generalized to a new situation not expressly covered by the test construct. The precision of post-test predictions is how price, precisely the test can predict how well a test taker can cope in the post-test communicative situations for which the test scores are being used as predictors. And we all know what scoring reliability relates to. So how do these three considerations relate to the sources of scale construct I discussed in the paper? The table here shows, for example, if the scale construct is focused on the target language use domain, then the score generalizability is likely to be reduced to that domain, but the predictions that can be made about test takers are likely to be more precise because they're focused on a specific target language use context. On the other hand, if the scale developers draws on a model or theory from the literature review, or a standards pro framework, then score generalizability is likely to increase at these sources of construct are generally designed to be broadly applicable. At the same time, the precision of the post-test predictions is likely to be reduced and it's difficult to make precise predictions to a very broad score use context. And finally, I also want to briefly comment on the use of other scales, unless, um, Unless you know exactly what the sources of construct were that went into the other scale and how it was developed, the effect of using other scales as your source of test construct is probably unclear and therefore I caution against that unless there's a really good argument for doing it. So this is how the model can be used for test development. Now let's look at test validation. When we're doing um, rating scale validation activities, we need to start by examining the status test construct and examine how well the scale aligns with this. So if the test developer, for example, develops a test that's designed to assess academic writing, then we need to ensure that the rating scale, which is the operationalized test construct, also is appropriate for this context. Let me now take you to an example where I think the two are clearly at odds. And I actually could have pulled out quite a lot of examples from our corpus of studies, but because I didn't want to pick on any particular authors, I decided to use one that's a little bit more neutral. Now, some of you may be familiar with the ICAO rating scale, which was introduced by the International Civil Aviation Authority as a set of guidelines that guides the assessment of pilots and air traffic controllers working in the international airspace. The ICAO language proficiency requirements or LPRs include a rating scale comprising six criteria and each with six levels. There's no information available how the scale was created, but it's problematic as it's not reflective of the discourse in the target use domain. Let me give you two quick examples. So first of all, in um, the criterion of interaction at level six, the highest level, the descriptors read, interacts with ease in nearly all situations, is sensible to verbal and nonverbal cues and responds to them appropriately. And you can see here that this is inappropriate because pilots and air traffic controllers, when they're communicating, there are no um, nonverbal cues available to them. So this descriptor is nonsensical. Similarly, when we look at vocabulary at level six, the descriptor reads, Vocabulary range and accuracy are sufficient to communicate effectively on a wide variety of familiar and unfamiliar topics, blah, blah, blah. And then vocabulary is idiomatic. Now, this is another real problem because when pilots and air traffic controllers are communicating, they certainly should not be using idiomatic um, expressions. This is a big no-no in, in international airspace. 
So there is no information available about how the scale was developed, but I've done made some inquiries and I'm pretty sure what happened was that there were a group of um, English language teachers and linguistic experts who were involved in this, who had no understanding of the target language use domain and they superimposed some existing rating scales that they were using in their teaching that wasn't the appropriate um, kind of scale to use. So as a result, um, the test purpose and the score use was not considered when the scale was considered was developed, which meant that the generalizability and precisions of post tech predictions are at odds with what the actual testing context requires. And the stated test construct and the operational test construct, which is the rating scales, were at odds with each other. So it's really problematic. So let me wrap up. Every construct choice scale developers make has different implications for score generalizability and the precisions of post-test predictions as well as score reliability. And the developers should think really carefully about the construct choices that influence the scale. Going back to this figure here, I've provided an example where the test purpose score use is at odds with the sources of scale construct and have talked about considering the impact of scale construct choices on the three boxes at the bottom. I've also mentioned that some choices of scale construct might cancel each other out in terms of its effects on generalizability and precision of post-text predictions. So the question then is, does it make sense to use many, many different sources of scale construct that may be at odds with each other? Because you remember in our corpus of studies that were some that used six or seven different sources of scale construct. And I, I would like to argue that in many cases, this really just causes validity chaos, and I want to caution against it. And that's where I will leave you today. I hope I haven't gone over time. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Ute. Uh, you haven't gone um, uh, out of time at all. <laughs> I would say you're exactly on the minute. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. A comment from Jackie Robbins in the chat. Uh, so this is your moment. You also have hand clapped uh, from the chat. <laughs> so um, this is your moment. If you have questions uh, for Ute, we have 10 minutes uh, for specific questions just for Ute's speech. So if you wish, you can uh, either uh, write your question in the chat area or as I was saying before, you can go to the reaction page, um, reaction section and lift your hand. So this way I will see your, your hand and I can uh, add you uh, to the pin video. <clears throat> Anyone? <clears throat> Nivia has a question? Okay. <clears throat> Just a second, Nivia, I will uh, pin your video. Uh, do you want to sign your question or speak? No, oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, hi, Ute. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, I was just curious about your last conclusion. Um, I'm not sure whether I agree. <laughs> And that always makes it more fun. So could you explain a bit more what you mean with validity chaos? And um, how come more information could not lead to a better skill? Yeah, I th look, I, Nivia, I think that's the issue that I see in many studies. Actually, the, some of the larger testing agencies are kind of, I think, doing this quite a lot. So... I think more, more information is not the way I see it because I think some of this information is at odds with each other. So if you're developing a scale for, a, let's say for a particular context, not one that's sort of just generally broadly available, 
then you should focus on the context and not just grab stuff from everywhere and anywhere. And when you read some of these reports, um, you know, they get experts in and you've got no idea what these experts are actually doing. And then they're grabbing descriptors from the common European framework of reference. And then they get domain experts in and then they do this and that and the other and they throw it all together. And you might say that's extra information, but to me, that's all just kind of noise rather than focusing on what you actually meant to do, which is, let's say, if there is a specific domain, focus on the domain. You know, they might have someone reviewing the literature and getting a theory from here and prescriptors from there and other scales from there. And it's just, to me, it's just validity chaos. Like we should focus on what we're actually trying to do and what where we want to generalize, you know, and just focus on that. And you'd be surprised when you, I don't know if you've ever purposefully looked through these studies. It's actually quite surprising. I've also done this earlier on in my career. Like I could have described some of my studies and go there, this is rubbish and doesn't make sense. So it's not like that I want to attack anyone, but I think it is validity chaos. It really is, you know, just do a bit of this and a bit of that and throw it all together. And yeah, we've made a new scale and here we are. Okay. Um, always keep thinking for yourself. That's what I that's what I remember. Make sure that you have to focus on what you want with the scale. Right. And and that it matches your actual test, like the wider test, because often it really doesn't. I mean, there's so many examples out there. Once you look, you know, it's a test for X, Y, Z, and then the scale is just grabbed from somewhere. It doesn't match. We also have another question from the audience from Joaquin. Uh, Nivia, if you want to continue the discussion, you're welcome to do that uh, later in the the webinar. We just want to give enough space to all. Uh, Joaquin, uh, you, this is your your moment. Go ahead with your question. Joaquin. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, first off, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor um, Nach. Uh, actually, your work is uh, an inspiration. As you know, we've been following you from Spain quite closely. I have a question related to uh, consensus, right? Because after working with uh, at several projects related to scale development, I have noticed that uh, at early stages, it is uh, uh, much... Uh, uh, faster uh, to work with small groups and then uh, to make the, the, the final product available to the whole community. However, uh, I also get the feeling that the more people you get involved in the project, uh, the more likely they are to um, be uh, receptive to the final to the final product. And I have had some trouble when trying um, to, 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 to present the final product to, to, to big groups who tend normally to dislike the scales because they didn't make the scales themselves. So this is something new. I don't want to work with this. So my question is basically whether you have had any such experience in which you have any trouble sharing the final product with the community, with the raters that were actually going to, to use them. And how did you manage that in case you, you have had such an experience? Thank you very much. I don't have really anything great to suggest, but maybe have several phases of dissemination, you know, work with a smaller group and then have a kind of dissemination meeting where people can give input, then take it to the smaller group again. I think this issue of buy-in depends on the context, obviously. I mean, if you're like a large testing agency and people just come for payment, that's different. But if it's in a kind of smaller context where the raters actually want to have some, you know, want to have some say and, and buy-in is important, I guess it's important to have a process where people get at least feel they have the chance to contribute. Yeah, because I think raters often really want to do that, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joaquin, for your question. Mm. We have an extra minute for a very fast question. If there are none, I would go ahead with the next. Yes, Norman. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was a little bit worried about your uh, description of what you mean by reliability, uh, because uh, the sources of variation in the scores is a bit complicated if you use uh, rating scales, because you have the people who are being rated, the test takers, you have the raters, and you have uh, other sources of reliability, which are usually uh, summarized as error or residual. And in your description, I saw that your reliability was uh, exclusively uh, determined by the, say, correspondence between the judgments of the raters, while the important source of difference between the test takers is uh, neglected. And I think this is a shortcoming in many of the language testing uh, uh, publications, and I think we should pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I, I think I'm not thinking about in my talk about it in this statistical way. It was more about rater agreements and, you know, that I didn't really talk about that part actually much at all. I just had no, it on the but slide I saw, there. Because I saw it in your description. Yeah, it was. It's kind of beyond the scope of the study, but there there are issues around scale construct and what the impact is on rater agreement or rater reliability. So, it's yeah. Sorry if that's confusing. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Norman, for your question, and also to the other um, people who ask questions. Uh, Uta, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's time now to move on to the next one. So I will call Christer Schoenstrom to turn on his video. Yes, again, we have clapping hands for Uta. Uh, Christer, please uh, switch on your video. There you are. Um, so Christer will be introducing his presentation on development of rating scales uh, for a sentence repetition test for Swedish Sign Language. Again, Christer, you have 20 minutes. Um, I hope the uh, video issue has been solved from those of you who reported some uh, problems. Um, so I will just switch off my video and uh, leave the table to Krister, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Hopefully everybody can see that. Great, okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to present this morning. My name is Krister Schoenstrom. This is my sign name. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the development of uh, the Swedish Sign Language Test, of which we have uh, done the CRT for, and we'll be talking about the scale. So today I'm gonna talk about these three uh, items in my talk. I'll be giving you a bit of a background um, of what we've done so far in terms of our testing development. Then I will present to you the rating scales, um, well, two of them that we have developed. They are both SRT tests. The sentence uh, repetition test. So yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, and then finally, I'll do a comparison of those two that we have developed um, in terms of the scales and, and the scoring that we utilize. So my presentation um, will be really about what our process has been, um, how we do our, our measurements, how we figure out what our scores are. So um, 
I don't have time today to go into a real in-depth as to what our results have been. Um, so my presentation will be limited to that specific scope. So until now, I've been involved with several sign language testing related projects. Um, the first one that I got involved with, I mean, I was quite young at the time, um, just working as a research assistant. Um, and I was involved in a particular project based on the sign language, American Sign Language uh, test, which we then took and modified for the Swedish context. So this was in the very early 2000s that we were doing this. So that was my first experience, um, and it was a part of my PhD project, actually. So I was focused on bilingual uh, education for deaf children, um, not specifically testing, but I did need to do some work on assessments um, on written Swedish um, and, and those kinds of things. So it wasn't my whole project wasn't based on assess, assessments and testing, but there was some of it involved in what I had to do. Um, so I, I eventually we developed the Swedish Sign Language SRT test, and we did that in collaboration with Peter Hauser, um, who developed the ASL SRT test, and we adapted that for the Swedish Sign Language context. Um, and then I did another project here at Stockholm University with Ingela Holström, and we developed another test. Um, which focused more on L2 learners of Swedish Sign Language. So these two assessments that we have, um, that we've done research on, we do have them published already. And if you'd like to know more about them in detail, you're free to uh, to take a look at those, um, those studies that we have published. We um, also developed the STS communication assessment for staff that were working at deaf schools so these are um, really focused on hearing people coming in to teach deaf children and looking at their communication skills and needing to have an assessment to make sure um, that they identify where they were aligned with um, on the suffer. But I'm not gonna be talking about that today. So, what we know about the SRT so far um, is that there are many sign languages who have now adapted it from the ASL version. Um, there's also a Swiss German SRT test. I mean, there's there's several of them out and about now, um, and we have ours uh, here based on Swedish sign language. Um, I think I believe Finland is on their way to developing it, um, and we're looking at doing it in both directions, productive as well as uh, receptive, and just being able to assess somebody's uh, language skills. So we're looking at L1 uh, users, and we can also use it to test L2 uh, speakers, users of these languages. So in terms of their ability, their ability to copy, compre comprehend, and then reproduce what they are seeing, it actually doesn't we're looking at whether or not that requires just language skills or if it relies on other things as well. And there's studies which have looked at it, which has shown a concern that if it requires too much working memory, then we're not actually looking at language skills. And that's really what we want to focus on, right? Because that's what we want to improve. So we're not focusing on improving working memory per se. We want to help people improve on their language skills. So we need to make sure we're testing for that. I mean, I, and I'm the first to admit <laughs> that the ASL test was already developed. It was a good test and it was quite easy for us to then take and modify for our context here in, in Sweden and in using Swedish sign language. And as a lot of you know, you know, sign language research is quite broad. There's a lot of things that have been looked at um, that have not been looked at yet within sign language research that spoken languages have. So we are quite limited in terms of our resources, um, either other assessments or other uh, just published research that we can 
sort of piggyback on and use to support our own research in these various sign languages. We just don't have that yet, that sort of breadth of, of resources. So we have developed two assessments, um, two SRTs for Swedish Sign Language, looking at adult language competency. And we want to compare adults with children's language. Is it different? Is it similar? Do these assessments work for both these populations? But we've started off focusing on adult language. Now, sign rep two, the other assessment that we have created um, is more interested in L2 learners of Swedish sign language. Um, but we also look at uh, children and those who are hard of hearing learning sign language as well. It doesn't get used on native signers. So we're kind of curious about how that comparison is going to work, right? That's what we've been uh, wanting to sort of understand. So in general, uh, just to give a basic explanation of the SRT, the sign repetition test, an individual will watch on a screen. They'll see a sign being produced on the screen. Uh, it could a sign sentence, sorry. It could be a short sentence. It could be a long sentence. Regardless, they will watch it. And then there is a blank screen which comes up and they're asked to give the response, which is to then produce exactly what they've just seen to the best of their ability. And they're allotted a certain amount of time in which to do that, depending on how long the original sentence was, right? And then this, this goes on in that, in that format for the duration of the test. So for the Swedish Sign Language SRT, as I said, we adapted it from the ASL version. One example, there's, uh, I think, 20 sentences in the ASL SRT, and they have varying degrees of complexity amongst those sentences in their SRT. So we took those 20, we translated them um, into Swedish sign language. And we also added um, some new sentences as well. So we, we already have a sign language corpus here uh, for Swedish sign language. So we looked into that corpus and we took some sentences from there. Uh, we ran a pilot study to test those sentences and we narrowed it down and we ended up with 31 sentences with uh, some were translated from the ASL uh, SRT and then some we took from our corpus. And then we had 12 um, that we created on our own that were novel. But we followed the format of the testing itself from the original ASL uh, SRT. And we needed to rate whether or not these productions were um, a, an equivalent match or if there were any errors. So if there was an error, any error at all, they were rated zero. If it was spot on, then they were given a one score. So it was either a, a binary score, one or zero. So here's an example of an easy sentence. Uh, you could even try it yourself if you want to, if you're feeling up to it right now, feel free to try it yourself. Oh, that didn't play. Let me, let me see if I can get that to work. Oh, here we go. What do you think? Was that okay? <laughs> Was that not, it's not too difficult, right? Um, but you, this was the sign, the, the sign sentence for an individual. And he then he used a dyxis, right? This is pronominal uh, pointing to the person that he did not like. Okay. So that was an example of an easy sentence. Now here's an example of a more complex sentence. So you can see it was certainly longer. 
um, and is much more difficult to remember. You have to have some familiarity with the language in order to be able to reproduce that particular sentence. So how, how did we score it? So I told you earlier, we have a binary scoring. It's either perfect or there's an error. And in the US, they have a manual for scoring so that their raters um, can be consistent. Um, now there are some signs which have their own natural vari variations of how they are produced, um, which are considered acceptable because they all express the same concept as the original. So an example in Swedish sign language, uh, for the concept of apartment, you can sign it this way, the way that I'm signing it right now, or you can sign it this way. So a slight variation in the production in terms of the hand uh, positioning. But we'll see lots of variation. So originally we thought, well, it has to be exactly the same. We cannot accept any variations on this. Right, that's the expectation of the SRT. However, if the person uses their own variation, which had has happened when we looked at the SRTs, we then look at, well, if over 40% of the responses are like this, we uh, then we say, okay, we're gonna accept that variation as um, and give the mark a one rather than a zero because it's, it's appearing more than 40% of the time. So then later on, when we have these variations, we know whether or not a variation is considered acceptable and they still receive the full points for that, um, or if we've determined that that variation coming up is not acceptable and we, then we mark it as zero. So that's really helped us in, in making those determinations and makes it really clear for the raters so that they know uh, what scores to be attributing. So consistency and reliability, right? So if we have a complex sentence versus an easy sentence or an easier sentence, the easier sentence requires less skill um, than a harder sentence would require, right? A good result would be 0 0.9. That's what we're looking for um, in terms of uh, reliability. So we, we give it to two raters. We then compare the ratings and see, um, and, and we're looking at inter-rater reliability. And if we get the score, then we know that we are on target. I'm just looking at the time. <laughs> I need to move a little bit faster here. Um, right. So for the sign rep, L2 assessment, which is a little bit different than the previous, the SRT, because this one is focusing again, as I said earlier, on L2 learners of the sign language. And this was related to a particular uh, project that Holstrom uh, led, which focused on teaching Swedish sign language and, and being able to assess these students. Um, and you know, to help them in their journey of learning the language. So it's, the design is similar to what I've just explained with the SRT, um, but there are smaller sentences and we even have uh, single signs that they're expected to repeat. Uh, we go up to two, three, and then four signs in a row. Um, and altogether we have 40, 40 trials. So there's uh, the L2, M2, right? So second language and uh, second modality aspect to this. And so we have a couple of different scoring perspectives. We know that things like facial expression are also really critical for sign language development. So these are things that we're looking for as well. We're also looking at their phonetic development and positioning. Um, and there's been quite a bit of lit and already uh, published what talks about uh, the phonology of learning um, a second modality, a, a visual modality is your second modality. Now in the previous uh, test, uh, I talked about the binary options for scoring was zero to one. Now for this test, there's actually a scale of five. 
uh, options. So here's just one example. So this is an example of just one sign. And you can see that he just did uh, just produce three signs in a row. And here's the rating scale. So it runs from zero to four. If the person um, it was completely incorrect, obviously they were given uh, a zero. They received a one. If they got at least half of the items uh, correct. <laughs> and then they can reach higher scores um, as they do better and better from there. If they've done most of it correct, but they got one minor error, we give them a three. And if they produce exactly the same as the original source, then they get a four. Now, it would be impossible for me to go through this with you in any sort of detail today, but just briefly to say that each item that we have on this test has a corresponding um, number attributed to it based on um, these various categories. So some signs have some morphological um, information. I'm trying to think of uh, for, for um, in terms of various types of movement. And so each of these have a different score, maybe for non-manuals as well. It has its own uh, expectations um, that need to be reproduced. And so the scoring goes according to all of these different aspects. Um, so I'm actually going to jump ahead to the last slide because I think I've, I've, I've carried on a bit too slowly here. So just to compare these two different tests that we have developed, I mean, there's gonna be pros and cons uh, per usual for, for any two things that you're comparing. For the, the regular SRT, we have a very limited scoring in terms of its binary. So it doesn't give you a detailed view on what the errors are within the production. So it doesn't really help with including language proficiency. It doesn't really assist, assess with that. It also doesn't take uh, non-manuals, for example, into consideration. And for those people who are not proficient in sign language, it's easy for them to not to do well. They find it very difficult to perform well on the SRT. Now, with the second test that we've developed, the sign rep L2, because of the scalability, there, there is a lot more information being provided. Um, it does include various features of sign language rather than just manual features. Um, so which tells us a lot more about um, the proficiency of sign language that that person has. So sorry for going so quickly, <laughs> um, but that was my presentation and hopefully you were able to understand it. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, uh, also happy for any suggestions and feedback and the like. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Krista, for your uh, interesting presentation. You, you do have a number of questions as well as a lot of uh, clapping hands and people approving your presentation. So let me jump quickly to, I'll quickly jump to the first question, uh, calling in uh, Anastasia uh, Parini, uh, so that she can uh, ask her question. Then right after is Ann Baker. So hi everybody, uh, first of all. Uh, so my question is, um, so how do you weight uh, the sentences? Uh, so do you look at the number of signs that compose the sentence or do you use that the com morphological complexity that might be also, uh, for instance, um, the adverbial incorporation, uh, et cetera? And so how then can we weight them uh, into in different sign languages so that then we can have also cross-linguistic uh, comparisons. So that's my question. And thank you for the presentation, which was uh, super. Thank you. Well, that's a really good question. Oof. Um, 
I'm going to say it depends on which test you're using, right? So for the, the first test, the SRT, what we tried to do was make sure there was variation in terms of the types of sentences that we had. And then in our pilot study of these sentences, you know, we looked at the results and then we were able to sort of group them. And I guess that, um, yeah, we were able to, to denote what skills somebody had. So for example, if somebody was a native signer versus uh, somebody who perhaps learned sign language a little bit later in life, right? So we had these different groupings and we looked at how they performed as a group, um, how they did with the more complex questions if that really matched with their actual language proficiency or not. Um, and like I said, during our pilot, we had a, a lot more sentence, uh, sentences that we were trialing and we narrowed it down to those that were consistent. So I would say the important thing is that you have the, the manual, right? Um, and a sort of a rubric for each item in the test. So for example, if, you have a more complex, morphologically complex sentence, for example. If the performance you're seeing for that sample tends to be have more errors, we're really looking at the individual performance when looking at the when, when considering the scale. Did I answer that question? I did. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Anastasia, for your question and also Christopher for the answer. Um, Anna Baker, yeah, I see you turned your video on already. Please go ahead with your question. And also Tobias okay. has a question. Thanks very much, Christopher, for your presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I hope we can be in contact later um, for more, more details because um, at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, um, Kate Huddlestone and myself are developing a SRT test for South African Sign Language. And um, we were immediately aware that we couldn't develop a test for um, early L1 learners of South African Sign Language without knowing exactly what the adult grammar looked like. And there has been too little research so we are using a SRT that we have developed together with other data to try and create our, or a more complete grammar. On the basis we have data, we'll have data from 50 young adult signers. So, but my question is specifically about non-manuals because in one scoring system you used in an earlier paper, you did not include non-manuals in your total score. Um, we are trying to distinguish between different types of non-manuals, ones which are used for grammatical purposes, ones which are used for information structure purposes, and ones which are used for discourse purposes like emphasis. And I wondered whether you have thought about this in your, you know, in your work? And um, what are your ideas about this kind of distinction? That's a really interesting, a, a really good question. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So with the SRT, that the, the basic original SRT, obviously there was no non-manuals that were considered um, for those reproductions. So, but what we noticed here in Sweden is that there did need to be some mouthing, right? And, and a bit of head nodding, uh, especially for negation, but that was required. So we had to add that for our SRT. Now for our L2 assessment, we did look, um, we had some of the shorter sentences which we, so we were quite aware of the non-manuals related to, and these would be more grammatical, right? For the shorter sentences. Um, some for emphasis or head nodding for emphasis. 
I mean, so, okay. So the issue then becomes, right, how to, how to document this and, and how they get rated, right? Do they, is it clear enough for both raters to identify in the same way? And then it becomes a problem for inter-rater reliability, right? If you if the non-manuals aren't being rated in the same exact way. So for us, we focus more on the grammatical um, and the mouthing, so sort of lexical-ish uh, non-manuals. Those categories uh, is what we focused more on uh, for our L2 assessment. But it's, it becomes much more complicated if we're looking at all the types of non-manuals, because um, I think that that's going to cause a big problem when it comes to rating um, those assessments. And we wanted to avoid that. Thanks very much indeed. Great. But we'll be in contact. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's talk about this some more, Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, as well, for the question, and Christer as well. Uh, we are now at the break time. There were more, two more questions, one from Tobias Haug and one from Katja Tissi. So I'm asking um, Tobias and Katja to uh, just hold on the question till the discussion phase at the end of the of the next presentation so that we can have more time and more space uh, for all the discussion. I hope you agree. I don't want to be rude, but <laughs> breaks are also important. All right. So Thank this you. is our break time. We have 10 minutes. So we'll see you back at 1020. Thank you very much.
So just a gentle nudge to make people come back. Here you are. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so okay, so let's go ahead and introduce the next uh, presenters, um, which is a group of a few researchers. Uh, we have Katya Tissi, Franz Holzet, Holzen next. <laughs> and Tobias Haug from the University of Teacher Education with Special Needs uh, in Zurich, uh, Alessia Battisti from the University of Zurich, and Nidia De Jong from Leiden University presenting the development of a fluency rating scale for Swiss German Sign Language. So welcome, and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. <clears throat> so. Yeah, thanks a lot. Let me share the screen. So can you see the presentation? Yes, it's visible. Good. So good morning, everyone. Well, you could, you maybe can have a quick look at the, sli at the first slide and then I will start. You see five names here. Um, uh, Maria, no worries about their pronunciation. Mine would be pretty bad if I tell your name. So, Battisti, correct? It's so correct. we have five people. So five people, four of us are going to present. Um, so please bear with us that we might need some change when we switch between presenters. My name is Tobias Haug. Um, we are going to talk about the development of a fluency rating scale for Swiss German Sign Language. So you might have a look at the slides yourself. Those are the issues we are going to talk about in the next 20 minutes. I have a quick background of the study. We will talk about the construct, what fluency is actually. We will talk about what kind of data we collected that informed the development of the rating scale. And we will talk about the scale. And we were also able to do a, rate, a rating study. So where the scale actually has been applied. And then we have a quick discussion and outlook. And then we can take questions from the webinar participants. The study I'm talking about is funded by the, or was funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. It was basically about to, to get a grip on what is fluency. What is fluency actually in Swiss German Sign Language? Uh, it was a project that started in the middle of the pandemic in November 2020. It was actually planned to last just for you know, one year, one year, but we almost we, we were able to extend it um, twice. It's a real on the concrete level. The idea was to have a fluency rating scale that is informed by data and theory. I let you have a look at the slide first. All right, we had three work packages. Um, and the very first one was that we organized a focus group with sign language teachers, deaf sign language teachers. And we, but the basic questions we wanted to know based on their own experience, what are characteristics of fluency in DSGS? And part, part of those, the results of the focus group also informed the rating scale. And the second work package, this was actually the largest one. We developed 12 experiment signing tasks that were manipulated by complexity and planning time. That meaning participants had uh, two minutes of preparation time versus no preparation time. 
And I'm quite happy about the sample size, to be honest. You know, in Switzerland, we have three different sign languages, and Switzerland itself is a quite small country. So we were able to recruit deaf L1 signers, 10, and uh, 9, sorry. Then we had we were able to recruit 10 hearing interpreters and 11 beginning hearing learners. You see here at the CFR level A1, A2, I think most of them are more like A1 than A2. And after that, we were um, by a team, by a deaf te annotators team, we had uh, 162 performances that were annotated. And work package three, so that's actually what we're talking about mostly today, is the development of the rating scheme. And now I'm handing over to Nivia. Yeah, so hello. Um, to inform uh, you about fluency, I will be talking briefly about the construct of fluency uh, for spoken second language. Um, so how fluency is defined in applied linguistics. And the broad notion, which may also be seen as a lay definition of, uh, of uh, fluency, is actually the broad notion of speaking proficiency as a whole, containing everything like the content, what you're saying, how you're saying, how accurate you're saying, and how fluent you are. However, we are interested in the narrow notion, uh, which is the usual uh, definition of fluency in applied linguistics. And so that it is only part of speaking proficiency. Next slide. So this narrow notion of speaking proficiency um, encompasses three different notions. The first is underlying cognitive fluency. So within a speaker, the ease of processing the thoughts to sounds, to speech. And for sign language, obviously, it would be the ease of the processes while you're signing from thoughts to signs. The utterance fluency is what you can measure in the utterance. And so this has to do with how often you break down in speech, how often you have pauses. And also when you are speaking, or in our case, signing, how fast you would be signing. And <clears throat> finally, perceived fluency uh, is what we measure in, in when we are rating. It's the impression of the listener about a speaker's cognitive fluency, but obviously, that is based on the listener's perception of speech or of sounds. Next slide. So what we did, um, we from theory, we know that preparation time uh, is a factor when you are dealing with fluency. The more preparation time you have, um, the more fluent you are supposed to be because you have had the time to think about what you want to say and how to say it before you start. Secondly, the three different proficiency groups that we have, we also know from theory that they should be different. The native signers should be more fluent than the interpreters and the interpreters should be more fluent than the beginner learners. So this is the theory that we know. And with this theory, we investigated the annotated data, uh, looking at hesitations, pauses, stretch signs, and repetition and self-corrections. And we also looked at speed fluency. For speed fluency, we look at number of signs per second. And for breakdown fluency, we look at the number, position, and duration of hesitations. 
as they occurred. And when people were hesitating, we also looked at non-manual components. Next slide. So let me talk you through the results. Uh, on the left, the results for speed fluency. And so here we look at the number of signs per second. And we see in the, gra in the graph three groups that were indeed all of them different from each other, significantly different. On the left, the native signers were faster than the interpreters in the middle, and they were faster than the beginner learners on the right. There was no effect of uh, preparation time, which is in the orange and the blue uh, depicted. So for speed fluency, apparently we know uh, that this is something to do with fluency. The more proficient you are, the faster you are able to sign. Now, from speaking research, we know that the more fluent you are, the less you pause, the less often you use a hesitation. And so we also looked at this. This is in the middle. There was no significant effect for number of hesitations. However, there was um, an effect for the position. We found that interpreters use more pauses within sites. Something to discuss later, perhaps. And then, uh, as expected, beginners produce longer hesitation. So when they hesitate, it takes longer their hesitations. And this was especially so when they did not have time to uh, prepare. I think the most uh, interesting results is in the right column. It's when we looked more into detail at the non-manuals when hesitating. So what we found is that beginners use less non-manuals compared to other groups. So they use, uh, the interpreters and the native signers use their mouth, their brows, and their head when they were hesitating, but beginner learners did not so. And so this is there is not so much an effect of amount of hesitations, but it's the way you hesitate. When you are a native signer, you know how to use non-manuals. Okay, next slide. All right, thanks, Nivia. Um, so basically, based on the analysis, Nivia was just presenting the um, we developed a fluency rating scale, which will be presented by Katya just in a moment. So basically, we had three kinds of data that informed, uh, not two kinds of data that informed the development of the of the, the rating scale. It was mostly informed by the statistical analysis of the annotated data. And it was also informed about the results of the focus group with deaf sign language teachers. And it was also informed by theory. So what Nivia was presenting on, so we know from theory, from spoken language, but also what has been published on sign language fluency so far. So now I hand over to Katja. I want to make sure that I can everybody see the PowerPoint. I want to make sure I can see it as well. Sure. Just, I'm sorry, just give me one moment. Katya, you are pinned and correctly visible now. Okay, okay, you can, okay. 
Um, but I can't see the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, that was the problem. So anyways, thank you. Hi, I'm Katya. And I work with Tobias um, and the group here. So my portion of this presentation is a focus on the rating scale, uh, the fluency rating scale. So you've already heard about the L1 and the L2 um, and the novice signers, um, as well as the interpreter L2 signers. So we've compared across these three groups and the intention is that for that to help us further develop our scale. Now we also had focus groups, which we interacted with. Now I have to say the process itself was not an easy one. When we used to look at sign fluency, I mean, there wasn't any, you know, empirical evidence uh, for anything in the past, um, but we have been uh, acquiring more understanding uh, very much in thanks to this particular project. So here we have a lot of disfluency. So there's a, a scale of disfluency across the board, right? Where there are occasions of less uh, disfluency and a lot of disfluency. Um, so that's been really helpful to us. So when there is a moment of disfluency, we then measure how long is that moment? Is it a long moment? Is it a short moment? moment? Um, we also look at it in terms of the non-manuals that are shown at that time. Do they match up or are they mismatched? And from that information, you can tell what is happening in that moment. And that helps us in the rating. So we can count how many times this is happening, how long are those moments, and do the non-manual expressions match or are they mismatched? Now, when these moments of disfluency happen or these pauses, um, it affects the, the fluency of the entire utterance. But there are also moments where there is a sign um, that is held for a longer time and that's utilized um, as a strategy. And you can see when that's being done. I'm trying to think of an example. I might sign this or this or something like this. And that makes it very clear. Okay, obviously this person right now is using a sign in their break moment of disfluency, right? And whatever this gesture is or sign they're using is helping them to prepare for what they're going to say again. Um, another uh, strategy is repetition. So they might sign something and then self-correct so they can then use the correct sign that they wanted to use. Um, another example that we've seen are individuals who will sign something and then they restart the sentence and they circle back. Then that may happen uh, a couple of times because what they're looking for is that the sentence that they put out, out into the world is the one that they want to be seen. And so they have a couple of tries uh, before they get to the one that they're satisfied with. So these are different kinds of disfluency. That the first one I spoke to where there's very clear pauses, the second type of dif disfluency where they are elongating the time of a particular sign, and then the also repetition. And then the third kind, which is where they just restart the entire utterance over from the beginning. So on our rating scale, um, there are these categories based on you know what we have seen so when the person is repeating their sign or in the moment where they are restarting the utterance um, those are the last two categories they're not always clearly distinct there there is a little bit of convolution that happens there and so we've been trying to develop a system which will allow us to make a more clear distinction between whether it's the second category of repetition or elongation 
versus if it's restarting the entire sentence. So we, we've been working on how to make those very clear uh, for our rating. So here's our rating scale. Um, we've been, been making some really good progress, I would say. Uh, we still have some more work to do uh, to make it even more robust. We're really trying to understand what fluency even means. Um, there are examples where you can see, okay, obviously the signer um, is incredibly fluent with their language production. And there's examples of those who you can see, okay, obviously they're not fluent uh, because they're using all these other strategies that I just spoke about. And that dichotomy helps us to understand what's happening on either end of the scale. Um, so I will now turn it over to somebody else. Okay. Um, Yes, before I hand over to Franz, um, so basically, slide. no, Franz, Franz, sorry, it's yours, your part, no, it's, sorry. It's the wrong slide, you, you went one slide too far. Oh, sorry. All right, um, so we were also able to, to, uh, to we, we are able to recruit three deaf sign language teachers, DSJS with German Sign Language. Um, Katja was conducting a, a rated training with them online. And actually, all all uh, sign production we had was so the space. So was the same as the one we used for the annotated data. That's like uh, one hundred sixty two productions, which were between fifteen to thirty seconds. So they were rated by all three raters. Uh yeah, and each production was about twenty to thirty seconds long. So I will now hand over to Franz, who will present on the results. Okay, it's just, um, can you go to the next slide, Tobias, please? So we analyzed this rating data. Previous slide, yes. Um, we analyzed this um, data using many facets rash measurement to see whether what Nivea was talking about before actually also holds up for the ratings. Now oh, the interpreter is no longer pinned, Tobias. Can you spotlight the interpreter? Thanks. So in order to do that, we um, created a five-facet model consisting of the raters, the signers, the, those were the participants, we also included the language backgrounds of the signers in, in the model as a dummy facet. And the tasks and the criteria were included as a separate facet in the model. Next slide, please. So these are the results, just very briefly. Um, we had a quite a good model fit. So the rash measures explained about 50% of the variance. We also had very good fit statistics um, throughout all of the facets. So there were no misfitting raters, no misfitting signers, no misfitting tasks and no misfitting criteria, which was, was good. When you look at the column for the raters, and you can click next to BS please. You can see that of the three raters, one rater was much more severe than the other two raters. Rater three down there was a rating much more harshly than the other two raters. The other two raters agreed with one another very well. However, rater three was consistently severe. So he or she um, showed very good fit statistics. They were just stricter in applying the rating scale. Now, when you look at the participants column, next to BS, please. 
you can see that the L1 participants, so the deaf signers, performed the best out of the three, which is what we expected, which is what we hoped for. Um, if it were the other way around, there would be something wrong with the rating scale, but this actually confirmed the findings of the annotated data. The L1 raters performed better than the L2 interpreters. And there was quite a, a gap between those two and the L2 learners. So the L2 learners performed the worst, um, they received the lowest ratings. When, look, when we look at the task column, next to us, please. This also confirmed the findings of the annotated data that there was no difference really between the six tasks. So three of the tasks were with preparation time and the other tasks were without preparation time. And interestingly, that didn't make any difference. So the model was not able to separate between those six tasks in terms of, or between those tasks in terms of um, difficulty. And that's something we need to look into why that might be the case, that preparation time did not really have an effect. And finally, when we look at the criterion column, next to BS, please. Um, we can see that there was quite a bit of difference between the six criteria statistically. So criteria one, two, and three, you may recall were about pauses and those criteria were the most difficult to uh, get a lot of points at for the three groups. Whereas the other criteria, especially criterion six was um, quite a bit easier to score highly. And I think I'll hand back over to Tobias to finish it off. All right, thanks a lot. Oh, wait, hang on, I'm clicking. Okay, yeah, um, discussion will be quick. Um, so I think we have a very good basis for for the future use of the scale in different assessment contexts. So I think we, we need to, as, as you could tell by what we have talked about, there are more questions at the end, well, that's normal, right? Um, but I'm really looking forward to use it um, uh, also with our interpreting students here in Zurich to use this as part of a larger uh, assessment battery. So I think we have a good basis to, to further use it and also look into it, all those open questions we still have um, uh, for the future. And we are currently preparing a, a publication, um, which hopefully should be out at some point next year. So, and if you have questions um, on the publication or on the results, just approach us. So I will stop sharing screen now. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Tobias, uh, Franz, Katia, everything, everybody for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> is there any specific question? Again, I see a lot of uh, uh, appreciation on your speech. I also see a few hands uh, raising uh, for questions. So uh, please uh, be minded, this is the brief 10 minute session just for the latest uh, presentation, the third one. Uh, we will later have uh, an extra few minutes, uh, extra half hour actually for a further discussion where I will also call in the previous um, uh, presenters to talk. Um, also, please note, if you are on your way out and you will have to leave before the time, uh, please remember to uh, fill in our survey. I will leave the link in the, in the chat um, area in a few minutes. So let's go ahead with the questions. Uh, Norman, you're the first. Norman Vel 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 Hest. I don't know. Norman, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I liked it very much, but um, I'm sorry. Well, by the way, Norman, can you yeah. please um, turn on your video? And just one moment, we're going to switch interpreters. I want to make sure that my colleague is spotlit before um, Norman asks his question. Thank you. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, 
as I said, I like it very much. It's uh, well equilibrated. But when I see uh, the scale that has been uh, developed, I see that three of your six criteria have to do with pauses. And the model that we use for uh, the analysis assumes that all these criteria form a single dimension. I'm not very convinced uh, by the analysis that you have a clear evidence that this is real one dimension. So I would suggest you to do some kind of differential item functioning or task functioning. Uh, you can apply a profile analysis to see if you can uh, see differences between your three groups, uh, say between uh, the tasks, uh, the, the post tasks and the, uh, or the post criteria and the other three criteria. I think you should be careful in that because you could maybe with some imagination, you could have had four or five criteria directly related to pauses and then uh, you would draw uh, your theoretical concept, uh, concept uh, much more in the direction of the pauses. That's uh, what my consideration is with your uh, uh, investigations. If you need help or further discussion, I'm always prepared to discuss with you and to help you in the way I can. Thank you. Franz, would you like to respond? Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm just struggling with the spotlights. I'm multitasking here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Norman, for this. This is actually something that we wanted to do. I didn't um, have time to go into detail here, but also we also noticed that the, the three pause criteria are quite close together, and we'd need to look further into it, whether there is really a statistical difference between the three pause criteria or, or whether it would make sense to to merge them in in, in some way um, so we can be sure that they actually measure measure different subconstructs so thank you for this comment okay the next stop is Krista uh, just give me a little time to um, manage the um, the pinning system. All right, Krista. Krista, you're pinned if you want to turn on your video. Oh, you think Thomas was first. Uh, Thomas, do you agree if Krista asked his question before you do? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's fine. Much, it's fine. it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. I'm happy either way. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, right. So first of all, thank you for your presentation. How, how interesting. Um, your discussion specifically about fluency. Um, I've got many questions. <clears throat> Let me ask you one for the moment. In terms of the self assessment, I recently looked at, in terms of Swedish Sign Language for the L2 learners, I looked at how they determined um, their own fluency. And we recently published with Johanna Mensch, Men Mesh looking at yeah l2 learners and how they do this so that for those who are novice signers you could see that in their self-assessment they rated quite high and then very quickly <laughs> they lowered uh, their own scores on these self-assessments as they progressed in language learning and i'm wondering if you saw that same sort of phenomenon happening um with your uh with your l2 learners Um, I, sure I can try. I'm not, 
All good? Okay. Um, Chris, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. Are you talking about self-assessment or self-correction? Because um, our, the, the participants, the L2 learners, they didn't self-assess themselves. Right. Correction. Sorry, that was an interpreter error. I'm, I'm asking about correction. Okay. Um, and can you then please repeat your question? Okay. So we've done our own looking into research on L2 learners and their self-corrections that, th that they've made, right? The errors that they're making and how they correct those errors. So for novice signers, we see an extraordinary amount of self-correction. And then very quickly, that time reduces as they progress in their language learning. So I'm wondering if you have seen the same thing amongst your L2 learners. And if you're seeing a huge amount of self-correction initially, and then a quick drop um, in terms of those occasions, as we have seen. So I'm curious what your data shows. Um, maybe, maybe France, you just join in later if you want, but I um, mean, our data, we just collect, we didn't have any longitudinal data. So we just had looked at them at one point at time. So it's hard to tell if there will be a sharp drop and we have just this group basically. So that's therefore it's hard to respond to your question. Franz, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, this is something we haven't had time to look into yet. So we, what we'd like to do is to some bias analysis um, in Rush to see whether certain criteria such as self-corrections were um, used more often by, by L2 learners um, or whether also for the other criteria, whether, whether there were differences between the three language groups and the amount of pauses, for example, um, so this is something we, we still need to do in, in further analysis, but thanks for the question. Sure, sure. Sorry, I was silenced. Um, so let's go to the next question. That's Thomas uh, Geisler. I still, the day is not my day with pronunciation. So just a second, okay. All right, you're you're in insight. Hello. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, here at uh, the university in Berlin, um, we are also spending a lot of time thinking about how to perfect an assessment, um, and and rater reliability, etc. So I've got, like Krister said, many questions, but going to be asking just one for the moment. For the tasks that you spoke about, what what were they? Um, I'm asking because there are multiple tasks um, that look at that that have different kinds of complexity, and if we're looking at fluency, I think when you're comparing those that had preparation time and those who did it now for production you would expect the fluency to be better if they've had preparation time. So I'm really curious what those tasks were. And then I just go ahead and I'll ask another question. Um, and maybe it's, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit too much here, but when we look at what Sefer offers us, they talk about A1 not being, uh, not expecting fluency, right? Compared to at C2, right? Um, so then how, how do you make sure, how do you attribute points in this? Because we know at A1, fluency isn't even important in the teaching. So then how are you able to rate fluency if we're not even teaching fluency yet? Those are my questions. Uh, Nivia, would you like to add on the tasks? Um, yes. Um... Uh, indeed, we had tasks with and without preparation time, as I told you. We also tried to manipulate the complexity of the tasks. Um, and they were, um, so for instance, one task was a task where you had to place people in a train um, uh, according to their wishes. So some 
someone maybe a hungry person so you should place him next to the snacks or uh, someone uh, likes to look at the landscape so you would want to place this person next to the window and so the complexity was uh, manipulated by having just a couple of people to place or more people to place but we did not find any effects of complexity whatsoever so we uh, decided not to uh, uh, look at these but only look at the comparison with and without preparation time i'll stop here if i could say something could I also um, add to this response? Sure. Tatia, your evidence, so you can add whatever you want. Oh, great, great. Um, yeah, that's such a good question. Thank you, Thomas. Um, as has already been said, we assigned these tasks and some of them did offer preparation time before they were expected to produce. And then some were online, right? Where they were not given any preparation time. And we were also surprised that even with the preparation, even with the preparation, the fluency um, wasn't any better, that the results came up that they were quite similar. Now, there was one uh, task that we assigned where people watched a video and they were actually signing it as they were watching it so we could see that that influenced uh the, the that influenced the fluency <laughs> um and it affected the non-manual signals but then for the next task that they were given we took the video off so um and we could see that the results were a lot better just that's an important thing i think uh, to share and Thomas, I said, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. We have a next question from Ute. And by the way, we are now in the time where anyone can ask to any presenter. So it's the discussion phase. Whenever you want, you can just, uh, again, raise your hand and so that I can see you. And then you can come up next to for the discussion. And Ute, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. I actually had three questions and I'm really grateful that Norman asked my first one for me. So thank you for that. That was about dimensionality. My second question is um, to Franz. I'm curious whether you examined the scale structures of the subscales and whether they um, the rationalysis supported all the, I can't remember whether it was a six or seven or eight point scale, sorry, but like whether that was actually supported for all the subscales. And um, my third question, sorry, is for Nivia. And I'm wondering whether you have any sense of how the scale you developed um, would relate to perceived fluency. Yeah, thanks, Ute, for this question. This is something I also didn't have time to talk about. So we looked at the Rajendrik thresholds of uh, the scale and each of the scale points was modal, modal um, but what we did find was the, 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 that scale points one and two should be combined according to the Rajendrik threshold, so that instead of a six-point scale, we'd have a five-point five scale. But um, we, we are not quite sure how to proceed because um, you might recall that in the scale, only the extreme points are described. And the middle and uh, in between points are so two, three, four, and five are, are not described. Whether we should still go ahead and combine one and two to make it into a five point scale, or whether that then would, um, if we collected the data again. Binding across all subscales, or is this just for overall? This is like, did all the subscales have exactly the same scale structure? I would find that very surprising. Oh, I, I, we haven't looked at the, all the different criteria yet. 
this was just the ah overall, okay the overall. yeah because I've I reckon you will find some differences for the subscales if you do yeah, thanks. Yeah, sub thanks. analysis yeah but yeah we're we're not sure if we found like we for the overall um, structure if we find that one and two should be combined ideally we'd need to collect the data again to see if if we would get different results you see what i mean this is a general yeah. question i often have when when looking at the scale, scale structure just based on um, one data set um, and you then combine two scale points wouldn't you then need to collect more data to confirm whether the new scale structure is actually working better probably and you would probably want to have some different test takers to see whether it's transferable as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Handing over to Nidia. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, in the end, you ask about how the skill represents uh, perceived fluency. And so in the end, you want perceived fluency to reflect cognitive fluency. That's what you would want. And um, the, the scale um, represents cognitive fluency because we try to put in theory in the scale plus what we found from the annotations. And so because we found in the annotations that use of non-manuals was a significant factor, we decided to keep it in the scale. Uh, and so perceived fluency in the end is what you what you instruct your raters to do. If we instruct our raters to focus only on speed fluency, then that is what we will measure. Uh, but but because... that's operationalized fluency. That's not perceived. Isn't perceived what a general listener would like to me perceive. Well, I guess you could op you could say it in any way, but to me, it's what maybe what a kind of innocent listener would perceive as fluency rather than a trained writer? Hmm. Um, I think innocent listeners, you don't know what they focus on. So they may focus on grammaticality or content. And if we want them to measure the ease of processes from thoughts to signs, then we have to tell them what to focus on. Otherwise, they will focus on things that are not related to the construct that we mean. We can also give, which we have also done, in, not in this project, but in other projects, give raters the assignment to indeed focus on this cognitive fluency definitions. And then you will find that you get very similar aspects um, uh, as you get when you have them focus on uh, things that we know from theory and things that we found in annotations um, as representing cognitive fluency. I think my question is more about what an innocent listener would make of fluency and how that relates to your theoretical definition of, I guess, cognitive fluency. I'm curious how the innocent untrained person on the road would score without a described rating scale how they would score fluency and whether that would relate to your kind of cognitive theoretical theoretically based scale if that makes sense uh, it would relate partly to it but also partly not um, and the, because a lay person in the street may focus on accent because they don't know what fluency is or they mo may focus on uh, accuracy because they don't know what fluency is um, as i said fluency in lay terms is the whole of speaking proficiency um, and um, that's not what we mean to measure because we know people can be more or less fluent uh, which is a different construct from being more or less accented or more or less accurate so I don't want to ask the person in the street if I want to focus on fluency.
So Thank I guess you. the question was answered. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anyone who wants to um, ask a question to any of the presenter or uh, do we want to continue the discussion? Um, there were a few questions for Christian. So this is the time if you want. <clears throat> Tobias, I see your uh, your hand. So, just a second. Okay, there you are in the spotlight. All right. Actually, it was more of a comment than a question. I think it was a question asked by what's named uh, Anastasia, right? About how how we how how sentences uh, SRT sentences can be uh, like labeled or built up on in terms of complexity, and I just wanted to briefly mention something on a project we worked on in the past. We had a project about 10 years ago um, as SRT that is most mostly based on the German version, DEGS version and American version, focusing at deaf children and adolescents between six and 16 years old. At the same time, we also collected data from 10 deaf adult signers. So basically, we during the development of the test, actually redefined for us complexity in the mix of, let's say, uh, number of signs plus morphological complexity. Let's say a lexical sign might be perceived to be less complex than, for example, a classifier construction. Interestingly, but I haven't uh, looked at it in detail after a statistical analysis, our like we, we ordered the sentences in terms of their supposed uh, complexity um, that didn't work out. So this, the sentences are, we have now we, from our side perceived complexity sentence at the very beginning. So they seem to be more um, easier. And those where we saw they are easy actually are statist in statistical terms are more complex. But that's just, that's just not really, um, that's something we need to first investigate. It's not a generalization uh, I want to put out there. All right, thanks. Um, there is a question from Uta. So there you go, Uta, please. Thank you. I've got a Kind of more general question because obviously sign language assessment is not my area and um i from the two presentations that i saw today they were focused on what i would sort of think of as subconstruct of language proficiency so there was sentence repetition and fluency and to me they're kind of subconstructs of the wider language proficiency and I was wondering whether there are any scales on sign language that um, are developed more for very specific purposes so these scales that we saw today I imagine they can be used for a range of purposes they're more like a general construct and I'm wondering whether they're scales that look more broadly at sign language proficiency and also for specific purposes of use. Thank you for your question, Ute. Is there anyone of the presenter who wants to reply? Nivia? Yeah, just very brief as a um, uh, uh, acknowledgement that indeed our scale is a subconstruct of overall signing proficiency, the subconstruct of fluency. And perhaps that also relates to my answer to your previous question. Tobias? Um, I could add something and maybe also ask my deaf colleagues like Thomas or Krista to 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 respond to it. So meaning you know, what you were saying more general like a general proficiency. There are instruments around, especially in the United States. There's this uh, Science Proficiency Interview, or SLPI, that's been used. It's based, it's based on the OPI, or, or a proficiency interview. It's been developed, I think, I don't know when in the US, 80s, 1980s, or maybe even earlier. That's an adaptation that has been used in different sign languages. And we are currently attempting to develop something um, 
not similar, but like a more of an interview interaction kind of approach. Um, looking at specific aspects, I mean, the interesting thing is um, when you look at what has been published about sign language assessment, you can find much more about how to assess children and how to as assess adult learners or users of a sign language. So it's, there's not a lot around, to be honest. But I think there are a lot of tests around maybe within programs. That's why I was asking, wondering if maybe Thomas or Krista, if you could say something or Katja. One specific purpose that I imagine would be there would be for assessing maybe teachers of sign language, for example. I wonder if there's scales like that. Because teacher language pro prof Cause teacher language mm -hmm. proficiency is a big thing. So I'm assuming it's also a thing for teachers of sign language. So are there scales that are, you know, geared at a specific purpose, not just general proficiency or a subset, like a sub construct of language proficiency? I feel like there's so much there that could oh, be yeah, really yeah. interesting Absol to look at. Uh, and what you are asking, you mean like, especially like professional language use for language teachers, for example, mm -hmm. how they use language in the class, should use. Um, I, as far as I know, there's nothing around. I think there's a huge need for that. Definitely. Totally Interesting agree. Interesting project. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Or for uh, sign language interpreters. It's another specific purpose use, right? which I'm sure there needs to be an assessment for too. Yeah, there are assessments. Katya would like to add something. So please, Katya, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, um, wow, what a really important question. <laughs> How do we assess uh, sign language fluency for these purposes. Now, we don't have a, a completed uh, one, but thanks to this project and uh, helping uh, allowing us to understand fluency more, um, it will then take us to a place where we can look at that. But we have to first come up with what this criteria is. What makes fluency? What does fluency look like? You know, and use empirical data to, to show this. And then further to that, we will be able to create assessments for L1, L2 um, as well, right? And then we will have th these markers for what it is to be fluent in this way. But it's very challenging work to do. I, I think that we do have sort of a, a general intuitive sense of what is fluent, but, you, but that you can't use that for rating, right? You can't use intuition for that. You have to have empirical... Uh, you have to have stats and numbers in order to do that. So in Europe, we, ha we have a European-wide sort of conversation about how to make this happen, how to do this. Um, and But we've all come back to the same thing is how do we how do we denote fluency? But thank you for your question. Uh, Krista, probably, yes, I see his hand raising. Okay, just a second, Krista. Okay, there you are. Yes, um, I also want to thank you for that question. Um, I have the same question, and I've had it for a very long time. This is something that we have struggled with. I think it becomes quite problematic because sign language research until now, L1 research, L2 research, and, and what we know about all of these things is very minimal compared to what we know about spoken languages. So can I create an assessment based on something that we don't fully know yet? Not really. Right. So as I talked about in my presentation, uh, the first step is identifying these things. The same as uh, what Katya just said. First, we have to identify the criteria to be able to uh, talk about fluency, what fluency is, um, before we can really develop assessments to look at fluency. So if we do, we can do a global test, right? We can do the SRT. And as I talked about uh, the, our own Swedish SRT, it gives you a sort of a global idea of language proficiency. But no, it's not uh, for a specific, uh, it's not a specific sub-construction. Um, 
we're not looking really in that sort of detailed way. It's much more of a global general language fluency. Can this person communicate? And I think there are a lot of pros to being able to have that and be able to make a distinguishment between various groups and different fluency groups. But yeah, it doesn't tell you enough about what fluency actually is. Those tests aren't specific enough. And that that is what has been problematic um, and why we can't yet do what you're suggesting. So, but hopefully, you know, as more and more sign languages are researched and these kinds of things are identified, we can then create assessments based on this, those criteria that we've that we've found. Thank you, Krista. Um, I see Katya and Thomas have their video on, so I don't know if you want to also add some questions or if anyone else wants to add. Nancy, thank you very much for your feedback. Uh, we appreciate having you here today. Uh, Tobias, yes. Um, uh, Thomas, do you have a question? I see your finger. Just a second, Thomas. Uh, Tobias, do you um, want I to ask? I have a question, but I also have a comment I'd like to make. Okay, uh, Tobias, so should I give the, okay. So Thomas, uh, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, okay. Oh, wow, yeah, what a problem we have. Assessments are, are so complicated and we've been having these problems for a really long time. Everybody's you know off on their own, their silos creating these assessments. And as Krista said, there's been so little research until now. And also the SRT um, has not been matched to CEPHR, right? So SRTs were established a long time ago, but CEPHR is a fairly new thing. Mm -hmm. And so we still need to, to understand how to do these SRTs and make sure it's matched with the suffer, uh, which we didn't have before, right? So these are just tests that are, and assessments that are developed sort of on their own in these various contexts around the world. Now having a rating manual is allowing us to become more focused with our assessments, but we've only up until now been able to look at very general ideas of fluency and not specific. Now we can ask these questions like, what is fluency? What does fluency look like? How do we say this is fluent, this isn't fluent? Um, but it's highly complex. Um, but as we're coming up with uh, these tools, that that's gonna that's really gonna push us forward. And then the second thing I wanted to say is actually a qu question related to something that Christopher said. With the SRT, we have a a really big challenge there, and and the challenge is that yes, the SRT. Um, there is an aspect of it which actually is testing working memory versus language capacity, right? Can the person remember the sentence, right? So that's there's a little bit of interference there. But for me, the, the problem then becomes, how do you separate, is a person just copying what they've seen, right? They're, they're copying it, they're not really, it's, how do we know that that's, a, that's showing fluency, right? I may not know some another sign language, but I can certainly copy it and regurgitate it. I can reproduce it. How do we know that that's living in somebody's memory and that's becoming a part of their their language, the actual languaging experience? Or are they just blanket copying, right? So if I, I could do that in Swedish sign language, how could you say that I have any sort of fluency in Swedish sign language if all I'm doing is copying it? So this is another thing that uh, that I question about this, but thank you for letting me say that. Great comment. Uh, Uta had a question and also Tobia, so I don't know who of you wants to speak first. Um, I think I had my hand up first, doesn't matter. Um, Thomas, I really enjoyed your comment just now because it's exactly um, what I've been thinking about and not in relation to sign language, but in relation to spoken assessment and the increasing automation of assessments in English language. Uh, what you're describing, I mean, the, the sentence repetition task is very similar to tasks that are increasingly becoming popular in English language assessment big, um, that are delivered through technology, which are like listen and repeat, for example. And it's, you know, the, the proponents of those kind of tasks um, take a very cognitive view of language. 
And they're saying that that's a really good indication of language proficiency. Whereas I argue that just like you just did, that it doesn't show any production, right? You're just sort of parroting back. And it shows us aspects of language proficiency, like pronunciation, fluency. You can measure those, but there's no real production. And, and there's, that's limited, you know? And I think that's particularly giving a limited view of language proficiency at the higher proficiency levels. Um, you know, where where you need to be able to do so much more than just say, listen and repeat or watch and sign back. Um, Thomas, no, Krista, it was you, sorry. You said that we need to, that you need to learn more about what sign language proficiency is before further scales for specific purposes can be developed. And obviously those theoretical dimensions are really important. I fully agree with that and research needs to be done in that area, but there are other ways to develop scales. For example, if you think about, you know, maybe sign language, teacher language proficiency, you can develop them through the input of domain experts and they may be less theoretically based then, but they're still giving a really good indication of what matters to people in the field, you know, what, what about teacher sign language proficiency is important in the classroom and you can develop scales, you know, with less just a cognitive theoretical focus that are really good and useful. And, and there's been quite a lot of work done in language for specific purposes in, in spoken language. Interesting comment. Thank you, Uta. Uh, Tobias, there's your moment. All right. I think we have to wrap up soon, right? And um, just two comments about what uh, Uta and also what Thomas was saying. As for the SRT, I guess the SRT is definitely not the perfect test to assess overall proficiency. I totally agree. But it might be one tool among others. And about what Thomas was saying about this is just parroting, basically. I think that we have starting evidence indicating that it's not just parroting something because you see difference as a study for our ASL I think it definitely shows that there are differences between um, early learners of a sign language and late learners so there's, there's evidence around the other thing is how to match a CFR because we just ran into this problem how to match a, uh, an SRT with the CFR levels it's impossible because you find any scale. There are no scales in the CFRs that actually focus at repetition for obvious purposes. The other thing is an SRT. Tobias, that last sentence went by so quickly. I don't think I heard a word in it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a problem is that matching the or aligning SRT tests with the, with the CFR is problematic because you don't find any scales that describe repetition. It's not comprehension, it's not production, right? It's both involved. So that's why it makes it hard. It's, it's kind of like impossible. And the other thing, it's it's totally, it's totally not really focusing on communicative competence, right? If you frame language learning in this context, it's not really helpful. I still think it's a useful tool, but not replacing everything. It's just one tool, right? Among other things we are planning to develop. That's my That's my perspective on it. Thanks. All right, so um, we still have two minutes, exactly two minutes. So if anyone wants to add a very quick question, we still have a little, little time. I see people going, so thank you very much for being here today. Um, there's a question, Thomas. Uh, my question refers to how to separate between copy and real understanding. So if anyone wants to answer, to that, <clears throat> well, the discussion is going on in the chat. Um, uh, okay, so I'll spot, uh, I don't know. Um, well, in all cases, we're running low in, on time. So uh, let me just remind you once more about the, the, the survey. It's important for us. Uh, it helps us to uh, define the topic for the next webinar. So uh, if you did enjoy this webinar, please do um, add your feedback for us. Um, I would like to spotlight the participants of the day. 
So we have uh, Ute, Tobias, uh, <clears throat> Franz, um, Nivia, there you go. Uh, please turn on your video so that we can say goodbye to you and thank you for uh, being part of this, uh, this very interesting day of discussion. Uh, personally, even though we did add like one hour and a half to our discussion, I, I should say we, I still feel the need of more time for discussing these topics. So um, I hope this is a shared need by uh, all of the participants. Um, there you go. So thank you very much, Ute, and all the just, speakers. Oh, okay, yes, Tobias, please. Just just the last word. Um, I totally agree. I think we should have something on site at some point, a workshop. Uh, we used to have it in the past. I think, Krista, you were on all threes we had so far in Zurich. So I really hope that we can have one, I guess, not in 24, but maybe in 25, with colleagues from spoken language assessment and sign language assessment. That would be my uh, short-term vision. So. Ute, let me have you over. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank all the people who came in today and adjusted their time schedule to be here today. We really appreciate you being here. We appreciate people coming from all over the world. We feel very special today. Um, thank you for the questions, for the interest. Again, the webinar was uh, recorded, so you will uh, see it coming up on our social uh, Facebook page or also on the Alta page. If not, you can email uh, to Tobias. Uh, his email is in the chat, so you will find it. Um, uh, someone have asked for the presentation. Uh, again, please email Tobias for that. And any other questions or feedback or whatever, Tobias is the reference person for everything. So uh, thank you again for being here and thank you all uh, for this wonderful uh, chance to discuss this topic. Thank you to the interpreters, of course, for all the mediation work they've done. And again, have a wonderful day or a good night uh, if you're on the other side. <laughs> thank you again. Thanks. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <clears> Thank <throat>